Looking at the pictures of these extinct prehistoric animals, it is difficult to believe that they had once walked on our planet. In fact, the Earth and its numerous life forms were originally different. To understand the changes in life forms on Earth over millions of years, we need to know how life originated. The origin of life forms or biodiversity is interlinked with the evolution of the Earth, which is again closely associated with the evolution of the universe. The universe is vast, comprises many galaxies and is almost 20 billion years old. The Big Bang Theory attempts to explain the origin of the universe. According to this theory, a singular huge explosion caused the infinitesimally small, hot and dense universe to expand, which resulted in the lowering of temperatures. It even states that the universe continues to expand even today. After the passage of time, gases such as hydrogen and helium got formed. They condensed due to gravitation and gave rise to different galaxies in the universe. One of the galaxies known to us is the Milky Way, which contains the solar system and the Earth is one of the planets in the system. At the time of its formation, there was no atmosphere on the Earth. Its surface was covered by water vapor, methane, carbon dioxide and ammonia released from the molten mass. Gradually, the ultraviolet rays of the sun broke up the water, which was in vapor state, into hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen, being a lighter gas than oxygen, escaped. Thereafter, oxygen combined with ammonia and methane, which led to the formation of water, carbon dioxide and other gases. The high energy ultraviolet rays of the sun struck the oxygen molecule and split it into oxygen atoms, which in turn reacted with other oxygen molecules to form ozone, and thus the ozone layer was formed. Some of the water vapor cooled and came down as rain, which filled all the deep depressions on the earth and formed oceans. It is estimated that life appeared on Earth 500 million years after its formation. There are different theories that try to explain the beginning of life on Earth. Some of them are panspermia, spontaneous generation, biogenesis and chemical evolution. Panspermia is the oldest theory founded by Greek thinkers. It explains that units of life called spores were transferred to different planets. Panspermia assumes that seeds of life exist all over the universe. Therefore, the life on Earth may have originated after one such seed was deposited on the Earth from somewhere in the universe. This theory generates much interest even today. Another belief was that life arose from inanimate things. The theory of spontaneous generation assumed that life came out of non-living, decaying and rotting matter such as stones, straw and mud. Even famous Greek thinker and philosopher Aristotle believed in this theory. In fact, this theory was used to explain even Anton von Leeuwenhoek's findings of animalcules using the simple microscope. Moreover, some scientists such as John Needham supported the theory of spontaneous generation by conducting some experiments. In one of his experiments, Needham boiled chicken broth in a flask and then cooled it to room temperature in an open container. Later, he sealed this container. After a few days, he observed a few microbes in it. 
Needham believed that some life force had brought about this spontaneous generation in the chicken broth. The theory of spontaneous generation was in vogue until a German biologist, Rudolf Fierho, challenged it with his theory called Omnis Cellular Acellular, which expounded that living cells can arise from pre-existing cells. However, he could not prove this theory of biogenesis. Later on, Louis Pasteur, with his experiments, proved the theory of biogenesis and forever silenced the advocates of spontaneous generation. In his experiment, he used pre-sterilized sealed flasks with killed yeast. These flasks did not show any signs of life. On the contrary, in another flask, he exposed killed yeast to air. Surprisingly, living organisms were found in this flask. Another theory called the theory of chemical evolution was expounded by Russian scientist Alexander Ivanovich Operin and British scientist John Burden Sanderson Haldane. They proposed that the first form of life originated from pre-existing non-living organic molecules such as RNA and protein. They also pointed out that the birth of life was preceded by chemical evolution or the formation of diverse organic molecules from inorganic constituents. When the earth was created, the conditions were high temperature, volcanic storms and reducing atmosphere consisting of methane and ammonia. In 1953, American scientist Stanley Lloyd Miller recreated these conditions in a laboratory. He created an electric discharge in a closed flask containing methane, ammonia, hydrogen and water vapor at 800 degrees centigrade and observed the formation of amino acids. Later on, while conducting similar experiments, other scientists observed the formation of sugars, nitrogen bases, pigment and fats as well. Interestingly, when meteorite content was analyzed, similar compounds were found in them, which proved that similar processes occurred in other parts of the universe as well. Thereafter, the theory of chemical evolution was most widely accepted. However, there were still doubts about how the first cell came into existence. Cellular forms of life originated around 2000 million years ago as unicellular organisms in water. It is probable that all life forms originated in a water environment. This theory of chemical evolution which explains that first life forms arose from non-living molecules through evolutionary forces is now widely accepted. However, the origin of life is a fascinating and curious topic which will forever invite a lot of debate and speculation. For many years, there has been speculation and fascinating stories about the creation of the earth and its numerous species. Most religions believe in the divine creation of the world by assuming that an omnipotent God created the earth and its varied species. These religious theories have three connotations. First, that all living organisms around us have not evolved over time but are just as they were when originally created. Second, Diversity among living organisms has been uniform since the time of creation and will continue to be the same in future as well. Third, that the earth is only 4000 years old. These ideas faced opposition in the 19th century when English naturalist Charles Robert Darwin suggested that complex organisms have evolved from simple ancestors. In December 1831, Darwin went on a five-year-long voyage in a ship called the HMS Beagle with Captain Robert Fitzroy. During this time, 
he conducted various natural history collections and studied the geology of many places. He published the theory of evolution in 1859 in his book On the Origin of Species. Darwin pointed out that existing living forms share similarities to varying degrees among themselves as well as with life forms that existed millions of years ago. Several life forms have become extinct now. However, new forms of life have also come into existence during different periods of time. Therefore, life forms are constantly undergoing evolution. Darwin pointed out that natural selection was the mechanism of evolution. According to this concept, any population of organisms that adapts itself more readily to the natural conditions such as climate, food and physical factors has a better chance of survival. Darwin primarily emphasized the importance of reproductive fitness of the individual or the population. In other words, organisms with good fitness outbreed the others and therefore are selected by nature. Natural selection preserves and accumulates advantageous genetic mutations. For example, consider that a species develops an advantage as it grows wings and learns to fly. This advantage will be passed on to their offspring across generations. Inferior or disadvantaged members of this species who fail to cope with this change will gradually perish. On the other hand, the superior or advantaged members of the species who can use their wings with competence will be left behind. In this way, Darwin argued that natural selection preserves species with functional advantages as they can compete better in the natural environment and leave behind more progeny. Another British naturalist, Alfred Wallace, a contemporary of Charles Darwin, made similar observations by proposing the theory of evolution due to natural selection. Wallace did extensive fieldwork in the Amazon River Basin and the Malay Archipelago. He also came to the conclusion that existing life forms share similarities and common ancestors who were present during different periods of the Earth's history. The theory of evolution most certainly established that the Earth is billions of years old. It was also a path-breaking theory because, in spite of its contradictions, it demystified the idea of divine creation. The theory of evolution suggests that there is a change in the inherited traits of a population of organisms through generations. This theory gathers more evidence with the study of fossils of prehistoric organisms. The word fossil is derived from the Latin word fossus, which literally means having been dug up. Fossils are the preserved remains of animals, plants and other organisms found in the sedimentary layers of rocks. On observing a cross-section of the Earth's crust, we find that these layers are arranged on top of each other and signify different periods of the Earth's history. Therefore, fossils in different rock sediments pertain to the same geological period as that particular sediment layer. For example, fossil remains of dinosaurs belong to the Mesozoic era. Therefore, while some fossils belong to animals which have become extinct now, some of them also seem similar to modern organisms. Fossils suggest that some life forms varied during various periods of the Earth's history, while some flourished only during a particular geological period. Therefore, they provide evidence that new life forms have emerged during different periods. One of the most widely used and accepted techniques 
To determine the actual or relative age of the Earth's crust, fossils and ancient artifacts is radioactive dating. In this technique, a comparison is drawn between an abundantly available radioactive isotope and its decay products by using the rate of decay. Fossils are also of great help in morphological and anatomical studies. They also help in comparative anatomy, which is the study of the similarities and differences in the internal anatomy of organisms of the past with those of today. There are two concepts of comparative anatomy. Homologous and analogous structures. If we look at mammals such as human beings, cats, whales and bats, we find that all of them have similar patterns of bones in their forelimb. For example, bones such as the humerus, ulna, radius, carpals, metacarpals and phalanges are common in the forelimbs of all mammals. Notice that the anatomical structure of the forelimbs is similar even though its functions are different in all mammals. Thus, when the same structures develop along different directions because of specific needs of different animals, they are known as homologous structures. These structures point to a common ancestry and this type of evolution is called divergent evolution. Similarly, in plants, the thorns of the bougainvillea and tendrils of the cucurbita represent homologous structures and indicate common ancestry. In the same way, biochemical similarities also point to a common ancestry. For example, similarities in a protein called cytochrome C in all aerobic organisms and blood proteins in animals provide evidence that these organisms have descended from a common ancestor. On the other hand, when anatomically different structures evolve to perform similar functions in different organisms, they are known as analogous structures. For example, the flippers of penguins and dolphins and the wings of butterflies and birds are analogous structures. Since these animals have similar structures but unrelated ancestry, they point to convergent evolution. In plants, examples of analogous structures are potato and sweet potato which are modified root and modified stem respectively. Over millions of years, evolution has resulted in the creation of many breeds of animals and plants. Natural selection of the fittest organisms has been crucial to the process of evolution. The theory of natural selection is best reflected in the substantial increase in the number of dark-winged moths compared to the white-winged moths after the Industrial Revolution in England. In a collection of moths in the 1850s, before the onset of the Industrial Revolution, a larger number of white-winged moths than dark-winged ones were detected. Conversely, after industrialization, it was observed that the population of dark-winged moths had increased considerably in the same area. The reason cited for this reverse proportion of moths was that before industrialization, the barks of trees were covered with white lichen, which camouflaged the white-winged moth and exposed the dark-winged moth to predators. After industrialization, however, the lichen died due to pollution and the barks of the trees became black due to smoke and soot. This created perfect conditions for the growth of dark-winged moths as they could not be spotted easily on the dark surfaces now. Meanwhile, 
The white-winged moths could be easily noticed by predators and as a result their number shrunk. However, in rural areas where industrialization had not taken place, the count of dark-winged moths was low. This study proved that in a mixed population, organisms which adapt themselves to the existing environment have better chances of survival and increasing their population size. At the same time, no variant is completely wiped out. Evolution is also impacted by processes and materials derived from human activities. For example, excessive use of pesticides results in a selection of resistant varieties within a small period of time. Similarly, resistant microbes also emerge when we use antibiotics and drugs. For example, Staphylococcus aureus is a resistant pathogen found on the mucous membranes and the human skin in around one-third of the population it is extremely adaptable to the antibiotic penicillin. Therefore, we conclude that evolution is not a predetermined process, but a random process. It is completely based on chance events, chance mutations, and it is also impacted by human activities. During his long expedition on the HMS Beagle, Charles Darwin carried out several interesting studies on the geology of different places. One of the observations crucial to his theory of evolution was made by him on the Galapagos Islands, which are near the equator in the Pacific Ocean. The Galapagos is an archipelago of volcanic islands with varied wildlife. What amazed Darwin most was the extensive variety of finches on these islands. These species of finches differed from each other with respect to the shape of their beaks and their overall size. Darwin observed that all these species had evolved on these islands. These finches, also known as Darwin's finches, demonstrated the concept of adaptive radiation. It is a type of evolution in which species in the same geographic area, derived from a common ancestor, successfully adapt themselves to their natural environment due to natural selection. Adaptive radiation is of two types adaptive divergence and adaptive convergence. In adaptive divergence, animals of the same or closely related group exhibit great divergence in their morphology when found in a different habitat. For example, the finches of the Galapagos Islands. These finches had originally come from the South American mainland to the Galapagos Islands. With the passage of time, they multiplied and began to compete with each other for food. As a result, all the food resources on the islands were used to the optimum. To take advantage of all the available food sources on the islands, the finches adapted themselves to the different varieties of food. One observable trait that pointed to this adaptation was the altered beaks of different species of finches. Their beaks divided them into specialized insectivorous and vegetarian varieties respectively. Another type of adaptive radiation is adaptive convergence, where animals of unrelated groups occupying the same habitat exhibit common features. For example, Australian marsupials such as the kangaroo, marsupial rat, banded anteater, tiger cat, 
Tasmanian wolf and koala. Marsupial mammals are characterized by their pouch in which the female carries the young through the initial days of infancy. Many different types of marsupials with different ancestry have evolved on the continent of Australia. This type of evolution where several adaptive radiations have occurred in an isolated geographical area with several habitats is known as convergent evolution. On tracing the evolution of these marsupials, it was found that the drifting of the continents had shaped their history. When the ancient land masses of Laurasia and Gondwana broke apart to form separate continents, the marsupials were also divided into two groups. While one group of marsupials was isolated on the Australian island, the other group remained in South America. Thereafter, the marsupials on both these continents evolved in a parallel manner and hence this is also known as parallel evolution. Interestingly, on comparing marsupials and placental mammals of Australia, we find similar adaptive radiations between them. Although they have separate lineages, they resemble each other physically. Studies show that the impelling causes of adaptive radiation are the need for food, safety and for better breeding grounds. Thus, the process of adaptive radiation illustrates how life forms have modified and evolved into new forms. In 1859, when Charles Darwin's influential book on the origin of species by natural selection was published, it took the world by storm. Suddenly, the theory about the creation of life, which till then was only understood in religious terms, found a new explanation. According to Darwinian theory, natural selection is the most vital concept in evolution. For example, Darwin's studies showed that finches in the Galapagos Islands had survived by adapting to different habitats. This adaptation was evident from the altered beaks of different species of finches on the same island. He believed that the process of natural selection allows organisms to inherit traits from previous generations. These traits help them adapt themselves to their current environment and increase their chances of survival as they reproduce more successfully than others. Evolution using natural selection probably began on Earth with the origin of various cellular life forms with different metabolic capabilities. Darwin believed that the rate at which new life forms appeared was linked with their lifespan. For example, consider that a colony of bacteria called B is growing in a certain environment. In case the environment of this bacterial colony is changed, there will be some bacteria say B1, who will be able to adapt and survive under the new conditions. In a matter of a few hours, this variant population will breed further, pass on their new traits and establish themselves as a completely new species. On the other hand, in animals or birds, the same evolution will take place in millions of years as their lifespan is comparatively longer. While elaborating on the theory of natural selection, Darwin stressed fitness. Nature favors the survival of the fittest. In other words, individuals who are fitter than others have a greater potential for survival. For example, in the case of the bacteria, the variant bacterial population B1 had greater fitness to adapt itself to the new environment than the original bacterial colony. 
This ability to adapt itself lies in the genes of an organism and is inherited. Darwin also put forth the concept of branching descent, which explained that various species have evolved from common ancestors by adapting themselves differently. However, this rate of change may have varied across species. In this way, Darwin refuted the old theory of evolution by the use and disuse of organs propounded by French naturalist Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. Lamarck had conjectured that giraffes had adapted themselves and elongated their necks while trying to eat the leaves of tall trees. Over millions of years, giraffes had made optimum use of their necks and passed on the character of a long neck to future generations. Consequently, giraffes developed long necks over millions of years. However, Lamarck's theory about the use and disuse of organs is not accepted anymore. Evolution has always generated a lot of debate. In fact, no one has been able to say with certainty whether evolution is a process or an outcome of a process like natural selection. Around the time when Darwin proposed the theory of evolution, a British scholar and economist, Thomas Malthus, propounded his influential theories about population and the factors that lead to its increase and decrease. Malthus's thoughts impacted Darwin and he concluded that natural selection in population was also based on certain facts. For example, natural resources are limited. The size of populations is generally stable except for seasonal fluctuations such as natural disasters and that there is variation in the characteristics of members of the same population even if they look similar. These variations are inherited. Darwin observed that exponential growth of population due to maximum reproduction or overproduction is possible in animals such as microbes. However, the population growth of organisms is limited because they compete with each other for natural resources. For example, a rise in the fish population of a river will lead to subsequent competition among them for resources. Therefore, organisms who adapt themselves and compete fiercely will survive, while the weaker ones will perish. Supporting his natural selection theory, Darwin pointed out that it was the inherited variations in organisms that helped them adapt to natural resources to the maximum and survive. These organisms who adapted themselves better to their environment reproduced more. After millions of years, their progeny brought about a change in population characteristic and that's how new forms of life came into existence. Scholars have often wondered how the Darwinian concept of variation through inheritance actually occurred. Although Gregor Johann Mendel the founder of genetics pointed out that inheritable factors influenced genotypes. Darwin chose to remain silent on this subject. At the beginning of the 20th century, Hugo de Vries, a Dutch botanist and geneticist, based his study on the evening primrose and founded the idea of mutation. De Vries believed that it was sudden mutations in populations that brought about evolution. This idea went against the Darwinian concept of minor variations that occur slowly over many years and lead to evolution. In fact, De Vries argued that mutations were random and directionless. Mutation caused speciation and therefore it was called saltation or a single step large mutation. In the years that followed, the study of genetics became more specialized 
and provided several new insights into evolution. The concept of evolution was researched and understood better with the advent of genetics. In the 20th century, an English mathematician, Godfrey Hardy, and a German physician, Wilhelm Weinberg, founded the Hardy-Weinberg principle, also known as Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Using mathematical modeling based on probability, they stated that allele and genotype frequencies in a population remain in genetic equilibrium from generation to generation unless specific disturbing influences are introduced. In other words, the totality of alleles of all genes in a population is called the gene pool which remains constant for a given population. The conditions assumed for the Hardy-Weinberg principle are a very large population, no mutations, random mating and non-occurrence of migration. Hardy and Weinberg developed a simple equation known as the Hardy-Weinberg equation to study the genetic equilibrium of a given population. Let's understand how this equation is derived. The sum total of all the allelic frequencies is 1. Generally, there are two forms of a gene. That is, two alleles for one character. Each of these alleles has an equal chance of getting inherited. Therefore, the frequency of the alleles would be 0.5 plus 0.5, which is equal to 1. Let us name some individual frequencies as P and Q. In a diploid individual, P represents the frequency of the dominant allele, capital A, while Q represents the frequency of the recessive allele, small a. Therefore, we can also say that in a population, the frequency of a homozygous dominant individual, that is, A capital, A capital, is simply P square. In other words, the probability of allele capital A with a frequency of P to appear on both the chromosomes of a diploid individual is defined as the product of the probabilities, which is P into P or P square. Similarly, the frequency of a homozygous recessive individual or small a small a is Q square. Since there are two ways of forming heterozygotes or capital A small a that is capital A allele from the mother and small a allele from the father and vice versa. Therefore the frequency of a heterozygous individual or capital A small a is 2PQ. The sum of all these frequencies is dominant plus recessive plus 2 heterozygous dominant which can also be expressed as capital A capital A plus small a small a plus 2 times capital A small a. On substituting capital A with P and small a with Q, we get P square plus Q square plus 2PQ. Therefore, we get the equation P square plus 2PQ plus Q square is equal to 1, which is in fact the binomial expansion of whole square of P plus Q. When the frequency measured differs from expected values, 
the difference or the direction indicates the extent of evolutionary change in a population. For example, generally the frequency of P or Q is 0.5. If it changes to either less than or more than 0.5, it would indicate evolutionary change. We can learn about the occurrence of evolutionary change, the direction of evolution and the evolution rate of the selected trait by comparing the genotype frequencies of the next generation with those of the current generation. Genetic equilibrium serves as a baseline against which we can measure genetic change. However, it is affected by several factors such as gene migration or gene flow, genetic drift, mutation, genetic recombination and natural selection. Migration impacts the equilibrium because when a population moves from one place to another, there are changes in the gene frequencies of the old and the new populations. Therefore, while new genes are added to the new populations, they are lost in the old population. When this gene migration takes place many times, it is called gene flow. Another factor that affects genetic equilibrium is a genetic drift, which is a change in the relative frequency with which a gene variant occurs in a population due to random sampling and chance. Mutation is another factor that affects the genetic equilibrium. On some occasions, the change in allele frequency due to mutation is so different in the new sample of the population that they become a different species. In this case, the original drifted population becomes the founder and the effect is known as the founder effect. Genetic recombination leads to variations in offspring and if this variation is naturally better selected than the parental genes, it leads to speciation over a period of time. Natural selection also affects genetic equilibrium. It is a process in which future generations inherit traits with variations from their ancestors. For example, Darwin's finches of the Galapagos Islands. These heritable variations help organisms adapt themselves to the current environment, increase their chances of survival and reproduce more successfully than others. Critical analysis shows that variation due to mutation or recombination during gametogenesis or variation due to gene flow or genetic drift results in changed frequency of genes and alleles in future generations. In fact, natural selection makes the existing population look like a different population. It can also give rise to situations such as stabilization, disruption and directional change. Let's look at the distribution curves, which help us study the evolutionary process of the existing population. These curves also show how natural selection operates in various situations that impact a population. In the given diagram, the black dots represent the people who have died before passing on their genes. Notice that in stabilization, the extreme ends of the distribution are removed and everything moves closer to the middle. In other words, more individuals acquire the mean character value, 
which represents the highest number of the population with a particular trait. Natural selection can also lead to directional change. In the curves, notice that fewer people are able to attain the mean character value for a particular gene due to depopulation. Natural selection can also lead to a disruption situation where a greater number of individuals acquire peripheral character values at both ends of the distribution curve. This situation occurs when the individuals at both ends of the curve have a higher survival probability than those in the middle. Evolution is a slow and sophisticated process. The Hardy-Weinberg principle helps understand evolution as it provides a baseline to measure the genetic change in a population. The study of evolution is not complete without considering how the first form of life came into being. The unicellular organism cyanobacteria or blue-green algae was the first form of life on earth around 2000 million years ago. However, we still don't know how the organic molecules, which are the main building blocks of life, evolved into unicellular organisms. Probably some of these cells, for example cyanobacteria, could oxygenate the atmosphere thereby making way for other life forms to evolve. The reaction for the release of oxygen might have been similar to the light reaction during photosynthesis in plants. During photosynthesis, the sun's energy helps to split water, resulting in the release of electrons that are channelized further by light harvesting pigments. This reaction ends in the formation of carbohydrates and the release of oxygen. Gradually, protistis developed and slowly evolved into multicellular life forms. Let's look at the geological time scale to understand which different events occurred at what time in the history of the Earth. The geologic time scale is divided into two eons. Precambrian and Phanerozoic. The Precambrian Aeon is divided into Hadean, Archean and Proterozoic eras, while the Phanerozoic Aeon is divided into Paleozoic, Mesozoic and Cenozoic eras. Different life forms evolved in the three eras of the Phanerozoic Aeon. The Paleozoic era spans from around 540 or 570 million years ago to about 248 million years ago. It is divided into six periods which are the Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Carboniferous and Permian. In the Cambrian period, Plant life consisted of primitive algae and seaweeds, while animal life consisted of invertebrates such as sponges, starfish and sea urchins. In the Ordovician and Silurian periods, true plants with a stem, leaves and roots developed. At the same time, there was an increase in the population of animals such as sea lilies, mollusks and sea scorpions. The Ordovician period also marked the evolution of the first vertebrate, the jawless fish, around 350 million years ago. For example, Cephalaspis and Hemicyclaspis. Next came the Devonian period in which plants grew in profusion 
and covered a large part of the this period also witnessed a rapid evolution of fish such as sharks and rays about 300 million years ago in the carboniferous period pteridophytes such as ferns and horsetails dominated the earth they were the first trees that thrived in vast swamps that stretch across the length and breadth of the planet. Over the years, these pteridophytes fell down and formed coal deposits. Meanwhile, in the Carboniferous period, around 350 million years ago, there were also fish with stout and strong fins who could move equally well on land as well as in water. These were called lungfish. For example, Neoceratodus and Protopterus. Another important fish of this period were the lobe fin fish, which later evolved as amphibians. Coelacanth is a lobe fin fish which was thought to be extinct earlier but is now considered a living fossil. In times of water shortage, lobe fin fish probably made their way onto land and might have added insects and other arthropods to their diet. Modern day descendants of lobe fin fish are frogs and salamanders. The last period of the Paleozoic era was the Permian period in which amphibians evolved into reptiles. They laid eggs with harder shells that were able to sustain their own water and did not get dehydrated in the absence of water. Thus, reptiles became the first animals to successfully lay eggs on land and are known to be first terrestrial animals. In fact, for reptiles, water was no longer a source of life, but a food source that provided hydration as well. Over millions of years, reptiles evolved into different orders. Each of these orders developed different characteristics which helped them survive in various environments. Today, there are four orders of class Reptilia. The first order is Chelonia, which includes turtles and tortoise. The second order, Rhynchocephalia, includes Tuatara. The third order, Squamata, includes lizards and snakes. While the fourth order, Crocodilian, includes crocodiles and alligators. Meanwhile, the plants that existed during the Permian age were ferns. Let us now take a look at the Mesozoic era, which extends from 245 or 248 million years ago to 65 million years ago. This era includes the Triassic, Jurassic and Cretaceous periods. In the Mesozoic era, Around 200 million years ago, some land reptiles went into the water and evolved as fish-like reptiles. For example, Ichthyosaurus. Meanwhile, the land reptiles of the Mesozoic era were the famous dinosaurs with terrifying large teeth. They were a diverse group of reptiles which remained the most important terrestrial vertebrates for more than 160 million years. The tallest dinosaur, known as Tyrannosaurus rex, was around 20 feet tall. 
Fossils of T-Rex are found in a variety of rock formations. Dinosaurs suddenly disappeared 65 million years ago. They probably became extinct because they failed to cope with climatic changes or they may have evolved into birds. However, the precise reason for their extinction still remains unknown. It is estimated that birds have descended from reptilian ancestors such as Ornithischian dinosaurs during the Jurassic period of the Mesozoic era. In fact, birds became modernized in the Cretaceous period of the Mesozoic era. The flora in the Mesozoic era was dominated by flowering plants and non-flowering plants such as ferns, pines, conifers, and cycads. Let us now take a look at the Cenozoic era, which began 65 million years ago and continues till today. This era includes the tertiary and quaternary periods. In the Cenozoic era, plants such as bryophytes and angiosperms flourished and continued to spread and diversify on Earth. This era is also known as the Age of Mammals, which are highly evolved vertebrates. They have a backbone which encloses a network of nerves which leads to a brain contained in a skull. Fossil evidence showed that the first mammals were like shrews. Mammals are characterized by viviparity. That is, they give birth to young ones, have mammary glands, and the unborn young are protected inside the mother's body. The evolution of mammals was a slow process that spanned across 70 million years. Mammals were more intelligent in sensing and avoiding danger. In South America, there were mammals resembling the present-day horse, hippopotamus, bear and rabbit. Due to continental drift in ancient times, land masses broke apart and consequently the land mass of South America joined North America. As a result, South American mammals were overridden by North American mammals. Continental drift also caused the safe development of the Australian marsupials. Meanwhile, there were mammals which evolved in water, such as whales, dolphins, seals and sea cows. However, the most successful evolution story was that of human beings, as they developed language skills and self-consciousness as well. It is baffling yet true that the original human ancestors looked like present-day gorillas and orangutans. From those primitive times, the human species has indeed come a long way. Scientists explain the origin of mankind in an evolutionary perspective. In fact, the theory of human evolution is being constantly updated and modified based on new discoveries in many fields such as anthropology, paleontology and molecular biology. Did you know that scientists have grouped chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans and human beings as four member species of the hominidae family? Let us trace the evolution of human beings through the ages. The fossil evidence of the upper Miocene epoch of the Cenozoic era show that around 25 million to 9 million years ago, Dryopithecus, a genus of ape, 
lived in Eastern Africa, Europe, and Asia. The term Dryopithecus means the oak tree ape in Greek. It is representative of the early members of the ape lineage, such as gorillas and chimpanzees. However, it lacked most of the specialized features found in present-day human beings and apes. For example, the canines of Dryopithecus were larger than those of human beings, but they were not as strongly developed as those of the apes today. The structure of its limbs suggests that it walked like the chimpanzee, but used the palm of its hands to walk and did not use the support of its knuckles. Moreover, the skull of Dryopithecus did not have the well-developed crests and massive brow ridges as found in the skulls of modern apes. Another man-like primate that lived in early Pliocene epoch, of Cenozoic era, about 12 million to 14 million years ago, was Ramapithecus. Its fossils were found in Shivalik Hills in northern India and eastern Africa in the beginning of 1932. It was an ape-like creature. However, on studying of its reconstructed jaw fragments and fossils, we come to know that Ramapithecus was an erect biped with hands free. Therefore, it was considered to be a probable human ancestor. The members of the Ramapithecus genus were probably four feet tall. Fossils of man-like bones have been discovered in Ethiopia and Tanzania. These bones suggest that Ramapithecus, who had hominid features, had lived in Africa almost three million to four million years ago. The fossils found in the grasslands of East Africa narrated the next stage of the story of human evolution. They suggested that Australopithecines of the genus Australopithecus africanus lived here around two million years ago. The main feature of the Australopithecines was that they hunted with stones but were primarily fruit eaters. The first human-like beings were Homo habilis or the handyman. As their bones were similar to the other Homo species belonging to the hominid family. They lived in sub-Saharan Africa between 2 million to 1.5 million years ago and had probably evolved from Australopithecus africanus. Homo habilis had stronger teeth, which suggests that they might have eaten hard plants and soft animals. The brain capacity was between 650 to 800 cubic centimeters. The next stage of evolution can be traced from fossils found in Java in 1891. These fossils are that of Homo erectus which had probably evolved from Homo habilis. Homo erectus were human beings of medium stature who walked upright and lived around 1.5 million years ago. The brain of Homo erectus was smaller, around 900 cubic centimeters. While the teeth were larger than that of present-day human beings, as they probably ate meat. Homo erectus flourished till about 200,000 years ago or even later and then gave way to other species of the human genus. After Homo erectus, there were several stages that led to the evolution of Homo sapiens. Fossil evidence suggests that between 1 lakh to 40,000 years ago, Homo sapiens neanderthalensis or Neanderthal man with a brain size of 1400 cubic centimeters, lived in Europe, 
Northern Africa, and Eastern and Central Asia. The word Neanderthal is derived from the Neanderthal Valley in East Germany, where a homo fossil was found in 1856. The Neanderthal man is supposed to be the primitive ancestor of the modern man. Members of the Neanderthal species used hides to cover their bodies and buried their dead. They were cave dwellers and good hunters and could use many tools. Neanderthal man was considered to be in direct line of ancestry of modern man. But they were wiped out by another primate, the Cro-Magnon man or Homo sapien fossilis, about 25,000 years ago. Fossils of Cro-Magnon man were discovered from the caves of northwestern Italy and France. These fossils suggested that the Cro-Magnon man had evolved between 20,000 and 50,000 years ago during the last glacial period. And their brain capacity was about 1660 cubic centimeters. The members of Cro-Magnon species were cave dwellers, good hunters, and carnivorous. They did not have any knowledge of agriculture and domestication of animals. The next species, Homo sapiens sapiens, probably evolved from the Cro-Magnon man between 75,000 and 10,000 years ago during the Ice Age. They began to practice agriculture around 10,000 years ago and settled in colonies. These were the formative beginnings of society, which slowly led to the rise of cities, empires and civilizations owing to constant human growth and evolution.